Welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast, your source for information on hunting, fishing, and all of your outdoor passions. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast. My name is Mike Anderson, and today we're going to be talking with Bob Downey, Bassmaster Elite Series Angler, talking fishing lures and tactics. Rapala and VMC decided to pitch in with a $500 prize package that we're going to be giving away here. And I'm going to let you know how to enter right now. Step one, go to the Shields Outdoors YouTube page and subscribe. Step two, find this video and post into the comments of that video and you're going to get entered to win this $500 prize package. We're going to be talking about a bunch of lures in there, so make sure to go to that, get yourself registered. And now, on to the main event. Bob, thank you for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you developed a passion for fishing? Yeah, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on, you guys. Um, I grew up in the Twin Cities metro area of Minnesota, uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis area, um, and really kind of grew up in a fishing family. You know, my aunts and uncles on both sides of the family and my grandpa, uh, mom and dad, really all are kind of in the, into the outdoors and fishing. And um, kind of cut my teeth probably up in northern Minnesota at my grandparents' cabin. Um, it's about an hour or so north of Brainerd, uh, Minnesota, and spent a lot of time up there uh, in my kind of elementary and middle school years as a younger kid, and then kind of expanded out from there and uh, got my first canoe when I got my driver's license and would tow that around to little lakes around the Egan area, which Egan's a suburb of the Twin Cities, um, and then Got a small 14-foot boat with a 30-horsepower engine on it and fished little club tournaments out of that. And um, actually fished college tournaments out of that for a little bit, too, before getting an older bass boat and then kind of just slowly worked up from there. Um, fished for the University of Iowa in college and um, then, you know, fished the Bassmaster Opens a few years ago and got fortunate enough to qualify for the Elite Series. And so that's where I am today. That's very cool. And, you know, I, I'm a Midwesterner myself and, you know, a lot of Midwesterners have have started, uh, you know, kind of getting into that bass game, you know, mm -hmm. just starting with that little 14 foot boat. You know, I, I had a 12 foot mm -hmm. boat, all these little pocket lakes around. It's just a, a super efficient yeah. way to kind of get into a lot of that stuff. But, um, yeah. you know, how do you feel uh, being originally from the Midwest has has set you up for the bass tournament game? Um, so there's, it's definitely, like you said, taken off in popularity a little bit more. I think, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, it wasn't as popular to see Midwest guys traveling the nation to compete with a lot of the guys that are from the Southern states. And so we've definitely seen more of that in the last five to 10 years. And, um, you know, how it set me up, I, you know, we have a lot of natural lakes in Minnesota and so we don't really have reservoirs. Um, like they do down south. So it's a lot of, you know, you're fishing grass, you know, whether it's milfoil or coontail submerged grass or you're fishing lily pads and bulrushes and that sort of thing. Or there are some offshore rock um, that we can fish to in the middle of the summer. So you get real comfortable fishing around grass, which, uh, you know, down south, we do run into that occasionally. Um, this year we've run into it maybe a little bit more um, than most years. There's been a few places that don't really have any in it, but um, just being comfortable fishing around grass is a big deal and you get that in your natural lakes. Um, and then we have some good smallmouth fisheries. You know, Mille Lacs is one of the best smallmouth fisheries in the world right now. Um, I've spent a decent amount of time out there. And so that really prepares you for kind of the stuff out in New York or the Great Lakes, uh, smallmouth fishing, you kind of get a taste for that. And then I've also fished the Mississippi River quite a bit too, down in that like Red Wing to La Crosse uh, stretch. And that has taught me a ton about just adapting to changing conditions on the fly. You know, the river goes up, it goes down. 
Uh, you kind of need to adjust to water levels and then, you know, just the seasonal movements of fish on a river versus a natural lake uh, tend to be quite a bit different. So those three types of bodies of water, kind of the glacial clean rock lakes like Mille Lacs, your natural grass lakes, and then the river have really kind of set me up to see a bunch of different scenarios that we actually see quite a bit throughout the country. Um, so it's actually a pretty good area to learn. We just have a lot shorter season. We can't fish 12 months out of the year in open water. So that's really the, the biggest setback for us up here is that, you know, the guys down south can kind of hone their craft 12 months out of the year if they want to. And up here we're limited to, you know, five, maybe six months out of the year um, if you're pushing it in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually going to be my next question is like, do you think that, uh, you know, being in the Midwest, we've got ice in the winter. So does that like really have a negative effect or does that maybe open you up to, uh, you know, creative ways of of targeting fish? Yeah, I can definitely, you kind of learn how to fish in cold water periods um, a little bit more in, you know, that fall, late fall period. Um, if anybody kind of pays attention to the elite series, you saw Jeff Gustafson win this year, catching smallmouth, you know, vertically below the boat, looking at him on his electronics. And he does that in open water, but he can also hone those skills, uh, through the ice too. And so he was very comfortable doing that, um, you know, because of his ice fishing skills too. So it does open up some windows. It's pretty pretty situational um we don't you know see a lot of those cold water smallmouth tournaments a lot down south but every so often they come across one so that might be one area where where it might help you um the biggest thing that i noticed is being that our fish are under the ice six months out of the year that and and they just don't get a lot of pressure they're not real educated and so if you want to go out and learn whatever technique it may be drop shotting or deep cranking or uh, throwing a wacky rig up shallow. I mean, you can go out and usually catch, you know, 20 to 40, 50 fish in a day if the bite is good and really kind of dial in that specific technique and kind of figure out the flaws in that technique and what you might need to improve, whether it's your hook or your knot or the type of line you're using. Um, you can really dial that in when you're getting a lot of bites. And so, that's one benefit that we have up here being that our fish aren't as pressured as if you want to go learn a technique, you can spend a day or two on it and really get a lot of confidence in doing it. If you, if you want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice. And like, while I'm not a huge bass angler, like I'm very interested in it and I'd mm -hmm. like to learn all these new tactics, but mm -hmm. you know, for, for an application, like I'm, I'm huge in ice fishing, like suspended pan fish. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd always used to use just live bait, you know, find mm -hmm. the fish, live bait, catch them. And now it's like, okay, let's start using artificials. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like it's, it's went from, you know, I don't know if I can catch anything on this to like, it's a confidence bait now. So yeah. it's just, it, th yeah. that's some really good advice. Yeah. Really confidence good. is huge in fishing, whatever you do, whether it's technique or um, learning how to, you know, fish different types of bodies of water it's confidence is everything mm -hmm, so. for sure so yeah when we're now that we're talking about advice um what sort of advice do you have for people that are uh you know aspiring tournament anglers yeah i mean for me um the best piece of advice that i can give is just spend as much time on the water as possible um as your schedule allows everybody's schedule is a little different but when i was you know in college or even you know a few years after college when i had really no commitments uh, didn't have a family no kids i spent a ton of time on the water um, and i still do to this day but that's really when i learned a lot is when i would spend days on end on the water um, and you can read as much as you want and watch YouTube videos. And those definitely help to kind of shorten that learning curve a ton. But from an experience standpoint and a conditional like day-to-day, -day, you know, learning how to read conditions weather-wise, um, 
and, and seasonal movements, spending time on the water is honestly the best advice I can give you. The more time you do that, the more experiences you're going to have to draw upon um, when you get into those tournament situations down the road. And I guess you kind of also just got to be realistic with yourself. If you're first starting out fishing tournaments, you know, be realistic that you're probably not going to set the world on fire right away. It's a process, um, you know, it's compounding, you know, year after year, tournament after tournament, you're learning every time. And the more you do it, um, the more experience you're going to have to be able to draw upon going forward. And tournament fishing is a great way to really push yourself. I mean, you can push yourself when you're out on the water for fun, but, but I don't feel like it pushes yourself as much as in a tournament scenario where you're under the gun to, to perform. And if you're competitive, you know, you're going to want to win and do better. And so you're constantly learning how, how to get better under any condition um, that you're faced with out in a tournament situation. So it's a really good way to, to become a better angler in those tournament situations for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's just no substitute for time spent on the water. Right. And you know, like the more time you spend on the water, the more you understand like how much time you have in, in your full on schedule. Like, is this something I can even do? Is this something that I enjoy? Is this something that I'm super passionate about? Right. Yeah. And you don't, you know, if, if you're an aspiring like full time tournament angler, that becomes a really big deal is how passionate you are about it um, and how bad you really want it because most days are not very glamorous out there. I mean, it's, it's fun. You're fishing, right. But you're also, you know, you're under the gun at times and, and you're trying to perform at a high level and it can be stressful at times. And, you know, to push you through those, those days is really kind of where the passion comes in for it. You know, you, you gotta have like, that deep passion for it to get through those tougher days, uh, to kind of, to kind of get to that next level and get to the days that are more enjoyable on the water. So, um, tournament fishing isn't all glamorous, but it can be a lot of fun if, if you have that drive to push through the tougher days for sure. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing a few of these podcasts now and and had some tournament anglers like yourself, Pat Schlapper, Josh Douglas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the more I talk with you guys, the more I want to get into this tournament fishing. So <laughs> obviously, like I'm not going to jump up into like a high level stuff, but there's, you know, if you want to get into it, there's so many like local events and yes. you know, local yeah. clubs, stuff like that. You know, get your feet wet there and, and you yep. know, kind of see where it takes you. Yeah, and honestly, like the traveling around the country doing it full time doesn't have to be for everybody either. I mean it you can have just as much fun fishing your local team circuit with a good buddy for the summer too. Um, you know, you don't have to go out and travel the country and, and make it your full-time gig. I mean, you can have a comfortable life back home, have a good job, uh, family life, and still just go out and have fun tournament fishing and still improve your game just back home. And so tournament fishing at all different levels, um, whether it's, touring professionals or fishing your local Wednesday night jackpot. Um, you know, they're all fun, uh, in my eyes. A hundred percent. So I'd like to get into, uh, into some lures now. So what, uh, what sort of stuff are you really excited about? Um, from like the Rapala VMC side of things? Yeah, well, I mean, right now we're kind of getting, in, at least in the Midwest and down south too, we're kind of getting into that deep crankbait season. So any of your Apple DTs, you know, they've been pretty, pretty much a standard in the industry for many years now. Um, they just expanded their color selection this last year. Uh, they came out with some, you know, some some colors that really needed to be in that DT line, like a green gizzard shad, a citrus shad, those are real popular colors down south um, and actually work pretty well up here in our natural lakes, um, especially when we start to get a little bit of an algae bloom in the summertime. Um, they've got a good flash to them that imitates kind of more of a pale bluegill color. Um, I actually got one right here. This is the new. It's a DT20, but that's in the citrus shad color. 
Um, it's a really good color. I actually was down on Lake Chickamauga between um, uh, Neely Henry and Gunnersville and caught two over seven pounds on that one. So that was pretty fun. Um, just cranking offshore structure on, on Lake Chickamauga. So those DTs are always a player. Um, you know, we're kind of getting into that top water season now too. Um, I use the Arashi cover pop quite a bit. Um, this is a, a bluegill color right here um, that I like to use quite a bit around the spawn and post spawn. Uh, right now, you know, around the metro area, a lot of the fish are finishing up spawning. Um, and right after that is the bluegill spawn. And, and some of the bass will still kind of hang up shallow around those bluegill beds. And this, um, this cover pop works really well around the bluegill beds um, before those bass really kind of start transitioning to their offshore stuff uh, throughout the summer. Um, anytime those brim are up shallow spawning, you know, a little popper like that works really well. That cover pop, it's a little bit bigger popper than, than your standard ones that you see. So you can cast it really well and be really accurate with it. Um, it's not lightweight. Um, so it's a real good popper for around shallow targets that I've found for sure. Okay. Very nice. So, uh, I'd like to go to that DT crankbait. So yeah. what, um, you know, what sort of depths and situations or structures are you looking at? Like you drive to and say, okay, I got to throw on that Rapala DT. Yeah. So on Chickamauga, I was fishing like 16 to 20 foot of water. And a lot of times with largemouth, you want to be grinding that crankbait into the bottom, um, whether it's, you know, hard sand, gravel, rock, uh, there's shell, little shell beds um, on Chickamauga. So you want to choose, there's the DT lineup is very large in terms of their depths. They've got everything from a DT4 that goes to four feet down to the 20 that goes to 20 foot. So, um, you know, in our natural lakes here in Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, you know, maybe some out in the Dakotas, a lot of that rock that that are is in our lakes that we're cranking in the summer is like in that eight to, you know, maybe 16 to 18 foot range. You might have some scenarios where it's a little deeper, but you know, if you got a DT10, a DT14 and a DT16, in those three depths, um, that's pretty much going to cover you for our natural lakes. And what you're looking for there is basically hard spots on the edge of the, the weed line. Um, so, uh, or just isolated hard spots that don't even have weeds next to them. But if you can find some rock that has grass next to it, that's generally better. Um, so I'm using my side imaging usually to find that rock. Um, and then, you know, you, you can't really cast these baits right into the grass. You kind of got to either cast on the edge and feather it along the edge or cast out past the weed line and, and grind it into that rock. And we're probably just starting to get to that bite here around the metro in southern Minnesota. Up in northern Minnesota, we're still a couple weeks away from that. There's still quite a few. I was actually just up in the Detroit Lakes area um just this last weekend and a lot of those fish are still up shallow for the most part um, but around the metro i think you'll start to see some of those fish really start getting offshore here especially with the warm weather we got coming later this week mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so um you know not being brand specific here but what sort of uh rod length and action do you like to use with one of these dts so I, I prefer a glass rod um, and I tend to like a 7.4, like medium, heavy, moderate type of action. Um, you don't need a real sensitive rod for fishing crankbaits. Um, basically, you want a rod that's going to be able to allow you to fight that fish well once you get it hooked up. Um, Treble hooks on crankbaits are notorious for losing fish. They'll jump, they'll throw them, they'll, they'll dive at the boat and, and pop off. 
And so you want a, a real soft rod and that glass rod allows for, for a lot more give compared to a, compared to a graphite rod. Um, and so with, with any sort of crankbait, treble hook baits, I'm typically using like a little bit longer 7.2 to 7.6 rod that is, uh, you know, fiberglass. If you throw the DT20, like the deepest one, you might want to jump up to like a 7.6 or even like a 7.11 type of rod. Um, I know that sounds really long but it's going to allow you to make a longer cast with these deep diving plugs and it's not going to wear you out as much. These things really kind of pull back quite a bit with their bills. Um, the DT 10 through 16, you don't really need as big of a rod, but when you get up to that 20, you kind of want a longer rod for that. Yeah. I mean, that makes perfect sense. Cause if you, if your bait's going to dive down to 20 feet, you need it to get out as far as you can so it can get, you know, down yeah. to that depth. Yeah, um, so, exactly. Yeah, question on cadence for you when you when you throw mm -hmm. those. Like, when you toss it out, are you, like, giving it a hard jerk right away or, or reeling super fast to try and get it to drop? And then when, Yeah, when so you, you're, oh, okay. you generally want a little bit slower gear ratio with those bigger crankbaits, so, like, a 5 to 1 or 6 to 1 gear ratio reel. Um, that's going to allow you to not be as worn out when you're reeling that thing all day. If you throw a, like a seven or eight to one, that crankbait's just going to plow through the water and really wear your shoulders and your arms out. So that's kind of number one. And number two, you kind of want to vary your retrieve, um, until you figure out maybe what's working. So generally I'll just start with a standard kind of straight retrieve. I'll reel it pretty fast till I get down to the bottom and I start feeling my bait dig bottom. And then once I get down there, it's kind of just more of a steady retrieve where it's like thump, 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 thump along the bottom. And, you know, you kind of got to let the fish tell you uh, what they want, whether it's just that standard retrieve Sometimes you got to burn it the whole way back. Um, other times you can kind of hit the bottom and let it pause and kind of float back up and then crank, crank, and then let it pause again and kind of let the fish tell you what they want. A lot of times when you, the, the reason burning a crankbait works so well is if, if you know that that school is down there and you can get that bait to run right through them, they either got to get out of the way of that thing or they're going to, or they got to eat it. It's like, you know, they don't have hands to reach out and grab it and see what it is and inspect it. Um, they're either going to eat it or they're getting out of the way. So that's why burning a crankbait kind of along the bottom is so effective at times. Okay. That makes sense. So um, what sort of other new lures are you excited about? Um, I mean, th I got a few here. The OG Slim from Rapala um, is their new flat-sided balsa crankbait that Ot Defoe helped design. It's got um, kind of the computer chip lip on there. Um, it's, it's generally flat-sided crankbaits are designed for colder water situations just because they have a tighter wiggle. Um, they, they don't throw off as much vibration, which tends to be better when the fish are more lethargic for whatever reason. Um, but I actually just won down in Florida on this exact bait right here. This is a bream color, bluegill color. Um, so it obviously can perform in, in warm water conditions too, but this one um, is going to be uh, uh, you know, a standard for a long time. These flat sided crankbaits have been around forever. Now Rappel is kind of, they used to have a DT flat, which had this body, but now they put a new lip in it and upgraded the hooks a little bit and um, gave, gave it a lot of nice colors. So this is going to be a really key bait um, kind of in your late fall, early spring time periods, or if you need a little bit more of a subtle presentation for more pressured fish. Um, the flat sides, like I said, is a little bit more of a subtle action, not as big of a thump. And it's being that it's balsa, um, you know, there's no rattle on the inside of this one. There's no rattle chamber like you see with a lot of, you know, plastic crankbaits. So um, this OG Slim is going to be a really 
key bait and, and i believe they're coming out with some different variations of it real soon so uh, keep your eye open for for those other uh, little tweaks to it that'll be available to everybody shortly okay and what sort of depths can you get to with those <laughs> So this one is, um, they actually call it the OG6. Uh, so it, it can get down to six foot on 10 or 12 pound test. Um, it does really, really well around rock or gravel or shell type scenarios. Um, and so in the springtime on like the Tennessee River system, you know, you're cranking a lot of three to six foot depths um, in that pre-spawn period. And also on any of like your highland reservoirs that are full of rock, like like Table Rock, Lake of the Ozarks, Bull Shoals, a lot of those places um, in that, you know, 55 degree water temp right before the spawn um, is when that bait is really going to shine. And then, you know, post spawn kind of on more uh, pressured fish scenarios, I think it's also going to be a key bait. Okay, very nice. Um, any other ones for us? Any super um, secret ones you got? Not really any secret ones. I mean, I got, I can kind of highlight a few. So a few that I used on the Tennessee River this spring. Um, one of them was the Arashi Vibe in the Classic Craw. This is really kind of no secret. Um, Ott Defoe used this to win the Classic on that same body of water, and it performed really well for me this spring. Um, and then I also use just an old school shad wrap, um, you know, number six, really small, um, just in the classic, you know, the old school craw color from Rapala. Um, it's kind of, I don't know that you'd call it a sleeper bait, but I don't think a lot of people think about it for bass, at least here in the Midwest. But um, down on the Tennessee River, that's a really, really key crankbait in cold water. It's a lot like the OG Slim. Um, just a little bit smaller. And um, another one that I think gets overlooked a little bit is uh, this is the uh, X-Rap prop uh, from Rapala. It's just, it's a top water bait. A lot of people use it down in Florida, um, but you can also use it up here in the Midwest, kind of in the same scenarios that you would use this cover pop um, around bluegill beds. Um, you know, you throw it out, maybe in the mornings or the evenings around those bluegill beds and uh, or overcast days it's real subtle and i don't think they see a lot of prop baits compared to you know frog or buzz bait or poppers um, the prop bait i think is a little bit of a sleeper that gets overlooked and rapala has one of the best ones out there you talk to a lot of guys down in florida that have fished in florida for years um, you know the devil's horse is a big one down there but you know if you talk to a lot of these guys that act that x rap prop is kind of a quiet one that they don't talk much about down there and um it's one of the best if not the best prop bait out there just from a durability standpoint and action standpoint it's a pretty good one okay very cool so i'd like to move into some more lure talk but we've got this 500 hundred dollar prize package here whole yeah. bunch of different lures i'd like to just pull a random one out of the box and awesome. for the person that wins it i'd like you to just describe how to fish it what you like about the action um, okay basically whatever you want to say about the bait okay perfect okay so all right so we got our box here number one we have a rapala down deep husky jerk all right for that one that's probably going to be more of a walleye or northern pike type of bait and so what i would do with that it's more of a trolling application so if you were on a clear body of water that has walleyes so malax is a great example um, of where that would probably shine they actually do a lot of open water basin trolling in the summertime out of Mille Lacs, and that would be a perfect place to use that husky jerk. And you can actually do it on a lot of natural lakes too, um, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. I think it's some, we actually do it on our cabin a little bit for walleyes in the evenings. Um, it's just 
you don't even need special trolling equipment. Just throw it on a heavier spinning rod or a heavier bait caster on, you know, 10, 12 pound mono and get it down there and troll it kind of in the evenings. And that's a really good bait to be using um, during that time frame. It, what it mimics is kind of the tulipy that are out in the open basin that those walleyes are chasing. So that's what I'd use that for. Okay, very nice. So I might have to pick up a couple of those because I've I've really started getting into the the night crankbait for walleye. Yeah, because we've got uh, you know we've got this lake place actually kind of in the Detroit Lakes area, like you were talking okay. about. Okay, and uh, you know the main part of the lake goes to like 30, 40 feet, but then there's a big shelf around a lot of it, and then it mm-hmm. goes up. It hits like. It goes from 30 to seven foot, super fast. Okay. And then mm-hmm. it'll go from seven to four and like a long stretch. And those, those okay. walleyes are feed, you know, coming out of the deep and feeding there. So yeah, if I'm you're gonna, up on those flats, I would get just your standard Husky jerk, like not the deep diving one mm-hmm. and just get some natural, you know, minnow type colors and troll those on those flats or on those breaks. And I think you'd be surprised at what you might catch. Very nice. Okay, yeah. next one. We've got a Storm Arashi Swimmer. The you Swimmer. Use this one? I haven't thrown it yet. I got a couple of them. I've thrown the Glide Bait. So, from what I understand, that Swimmer is generally. So, the Glide Bait is more of like a methodical, like slower presentation generally you're Mm -hmm. not you're not really burning that glide bait it's more of a draws them in and they kind of get mesmerized by it and and eat it sort of scenario where you you throw it kind of where you might throw a spinner bait um around docks around big laydowns along maybe a rocky bank um maybe an offshore grass flat something like that those swimmer has two joints um, and, and is you can actually reel it quite a bit faster than that glide bait. So um, if you're looking to maybe cover a little bit more water um, and show the fish a bigger bait that you can reel faster, that swimmer is going to be a better option. So, um, you know, like this time of year, at least up north still, there are some fish that are still pre-spawn on shallow flats that are warming up right now. And that swimmer would actually be a really good option to kind of burn across those weed flats um, to draw a strike from maybe you know a larger a larger northern pike up here in the Midwest or or largemouth um, or even you might run into a muskie with something like that. But that's what that swimmer is designed for: is to be a little bit faster than that glide bait. Okay, very cool. All right, next one. We've got the VMC Sleek Jigs. It looks like it's probably more of a walleye bait um, with like a decent little keeper for plastic on there. So you could probably throw like a paddle tail, like a Largo Shad. Um, Storm makes a little three, they got a three inch version and a four inch version. Um, You actually could even throw if you wanted a fish bass on that, um, you could throw just like a straight tail worm on it on grass edges for largemouth. Same kind of areas that you throw that crankbait, but you can throw them more up in the grass and kind of pop it free. Um, it looks like it has a good plastic keeper on it. Um, so those will be the two things that I would throw on that thing. Nice. Okay, next one. We've got the terminator pro series spinner bait all right that one looks like a chartreuse one with chartreuse blades the first thing that pops into my head on that is uh big small mouth um in the summertime um for whatever reason small mouth like painted blades on spinner baits when you burn them across big flats in the summertime so if you were on a clear body of water, once again, I keep going back to Mille Lacs, but that would be a great place to throw that in like that, you know, two to seven foot range, maybe in lower light conditions, or if you got more of a windier day and the sun was out, um, that spinner bait with those chartreuse blades can really shine for smallmouth at times. Um, you know, you, 
you kind of want to flat with the right contents, uh, you know, big boulders, maybe sand patches. If you've got a little bit of grass here and there and patchy, patchy areas, that's all, those are all uh, ingredients to, to make for a good spinnerbait bite for a small mouth. Very nice. All right, next one. We've got the Rapala BX Big Brat Balsa Extreme Series. So that's more of a square bill uh, for bass, largemouth mainly. Um, and it's meant to be fished around, you know, kind of the gnarliest cover that you can find, whether it's big rock boulders, um, lay down trees. You could fish it across a grass flat, but that square bill really shines when you kind of um, crash it through a lay down or, um, or rock. You know, we don't have a ton of lay downs in minnesota wisconsin you see a lot more on river systems um, so it'd be a good option on the mississippi river uh, in the middle of summer around laydowns for sure perfect all right last one and there's a pile of baits in here i don't want to go through all of them but um last one is the largo shad so that was the one i had referred to earlier um that's actually becoming a pretty popular paddle tail um, for both smallmouth and largemouth. The difference between that paddle tail and a lot of the other popular paddle tails on the market right now is that one's quite durable, but still has uh, a lot of action. So you can catch quite a few fish just on one sweep. Um, it really excels for smallmouth, uh, kind of at all times of the year. You can throw it on the Mississippi River around sand drops or, or riprap, and then you can also throw it uh, on our natural lakes across shallow rock flats in the summertime, and then also out pretty deep in the fall when they start getting stacked up in certain areas. Um, that bait on like a Tokyo rig or just the regular, you know, a VMC hybrid swim uh, swim bait head would work pretty good uh, with that Largo shed. Perfect. Thank you. So, um, enough of the, enough of the package stuff, but, um, you know, one person is going to win this. So that's uh, awesome. Yeah. It's, it's pretty sweet. There's, there are so many baits in there. Like, I don't know <laughs> if you can see it, but it's just, Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's literally packed to the brim. So wow. enter to win this, you follow shields outdoors on YouTube make a comment on this video. So good cool. luck to everybody that enters. Good luck, everyone. Then, okay. I got a couple more questions for you. So right. if you're, if you're only going to fish bass one way, like you can only pick one way to fish bass mm -hmm. for the rest of your life, what's it going to be? Um, I'd have to choose like, I know this isn't going to be the most versatile way because you definitely can't catch them all times of the year doing this, but it would have to be like punching grass mats um, for a large mouth in like two to six feet of water is one of my favorite ways to catch them. Um, I just love the bite and it's kind of hand to hand combat close quarters. Um, that would have to be one of my favorite ways to catch them. It's definitely not versatile because we don't run into that all the time, but it's probably my favorite way to catch them. Yeah. Well, I didn't ask about the most versatile. I asked about okay. how you'd have the most fun. So yeah, that'd probably be the most fun for me that or on a frog, something like that. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've never punched grass like that before. So what's, what sort of equipment do you need to, to do that efficiently? So the number one thing is braided line. So you have to use braid when you're doing that. Um, it's just going to give you the best direct contact to the fish when you set the hook. And then it's also going to help you get that fish up and out of the cover. Um, it'll tear through the grass and cut through the grass a lot easier than monofilament or fluorocarbon. So you're using like 50 to 65 pound braided line. And then usually a, a longer rod. So I like you know, really a seven, three to a seven, six rod. Um, reason for that is you, you, when you set the hook, you're, you're picking up a lot more line than you would with just a, like a six and a half or a seven foot rod. So it helps with the hook set. 
And then you want some, like I use a, what's called a medium heavy, moderate action rod. Um, so it's not uh, a broomstick necessarily. It's not super stiff um, because that with that braid, if you had a real stiff rod and, and braid, you'd rip a lot of those hooks right out of the fish's mouth before, or blow the weight right out of their mouth. You kind of want a little bit softer rod um, not crankbait soft, but kind of that, you know, between uh, a medium heavy and a heavy action rod. And that's really going to help you with your hook set. So the braid, the longer rod, and then kind of that medium heavy moderate action is all pretty key to punching mats. Okay, gotcha. So you, yeah. you're telling me I'd have to go to a Shields and pick up a new setup because I'm a walleye guy using like Probably. spinning tackle and six pound, eight pound test. Like yes. you say, you say 60 to, you know, 50, yeah. 60 pound braid. It's just like total foreign concept to me, but like, I can see how that would be super fun. You know, I'm yeah. sure those bass just explode on those lures and like, yeah, it's oh. cool. It's a fun bite and you, you really got to, you know, winch them out of that stuff and you don't always get them out but it's pretty cool if you get like you know a five six pounder out of there and it's got a big mess of weeds around it and it's a it's a pretty fun bite yeah you're pu you're pulling up 10 pounds there you got a five yeah. pound bass and five pounds yeah. of weeds with them yeah it's pretty cool <laughs> yeah for sure okay um next question so only pick one large mouth or small mouth oh man I'd have to say smallmouth um, in when I'm out fishing for fun. I don't, my, I love fishing for them, but they break my heart a lot when I fish for them in tournaments. Whether they jump off or they they leave the area that I think they're in, uh, largemouth are just a lot more consistent and stable, and they seem to stay where you find them. Not always, but way more than smallmouth. But if I just had to fish for one the rest of my life, it'd probably be smallmouth. I just, I just can't get enough of those things. I think growing up here in the Midwest, you know, if I had grown up around here, I'd probably say largemouth. But we have some awesome smallmouth fishing up here, and it's just so fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're uh, we have some, we have some definitely good smallmouth fisheries. Like you've mentioned yeah. the lax a few times and you know, yeah. if you've never tossed Ned rigs on smallmouth beds, <laughs> you are missing out. <laughs> yeah. It can be pretty fun. Absolutely. So, all right. I got one last question for you. What is your favorite fishing story? Oh man. Favorite fishing story. Um, I mean, one that just pops into my head right away that I probably could think of some other ones that might be better. Um, but when I was living in Egan or growing up in Egan, me and a buddy would bike down to this little pond. Um, we, we were, didn't have our driver's license. And so we just put our rod across our handlebars and bike down there. And my uncle gave me a number 11 floating Rapala, a black with, silver sides um i feel like pretty much every kid in minnesota that grows up fishing has a floating rapala in their box and so it was my uncle gave it to me and we went down there and i vividly remember saying last cast and i threw it out there and twitched it once and a six pound largemouth came up and just smoked it right off the surface and at that time that was the biggest largemouth i'd ever caught and it was on a lure that my uncle gave me and it was kind of a fish that really gave me the bug for bass fishing. Um, and being that it was on a Rapala and now kind of being partners with Rapala today, it's kind of just a neat story that kind of how it all transpired back then to, to now where I am today. So that's probably one of the coolest ones that I can think of right off the top of my head. Yeah, that one is pretty cool just to like, you know, be a kid thinking floating rapala and then all yeah. of a sudden you're you're fishing with them in the bass master elite series right. yeah so, yeah so that's a pretty cool memory to look back on for sure 100 mm percent. -hmm. so yeah all right well bob thank you so much for uh for your time explaining a bunch of these lures that somebody's gonna win and you know a lot yeah. of your a lot of your favorite new lures that you're using on the tournament trail today 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. It's been a good time. Absolutely. Best of luck. Thank you. Appreciate it. You just heard our segment with Bassmaster Elite Series Angler Bob Downey on bass fishing tactics and lures that will help you put more fish in the boat or on shore this season. As a reminder, make sure to register for that $500 Rapala VMC prize package that we're going to be giving away. All you got to do is go to the Shields Outdoors YouTube channel, subscribe to that, and then enter something in the comments of this video. And with that, we want to wish everyone best of luck on the water this season, and see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Shields Outdoors podcast. Stay tuned for future segments and visit our social media pages, Shields Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram for daily updates.